to see everybody here tonight, uh, and it is, as Lonnie said, it's good to see everybody tonight. Last night, we couldn't see who I was preaching to in the dark, but uh, regardless, it's so good to see so many repeat visitors. We've got a lot of people that have been here so many different times that are visitors, and that's got to be encouraging to the brethren here. And it's good to see all the home folks turned out as well. I told you last night what we'd be studying about tonight. We're going to talk about life's pits. You know, we all go through times and stretches in our life where things don't always go away. Sometimes it's because of things we did. We put ourselves in a position that we're going to suffer and pay for some bad decisions. Sometimes it's just luck, the luck of the draw, time and chance, as the problem writer would say. And sometimes you just don't expect it, it happens, and you dwell on it, you think about it, and sometimes it changes our outlook on life. Changes our attitude, and it makes us become someone who we don't want to be. So tonight, what I want to do is focus on pits of our life, times where things don't exactly go away, and how to try to have the best attitude, how to try to continue to put God first and understand it better, and also understand that our attitude may affect God's will for us, and the position we're put in, the problems we may face, may be these tests and these trials to let our light shine that would work out God's will. Sometimes we don't allow that. We know by God's will because we say, I can't handle this. I'm just going to do what I want. I'm going to forgive God during these tough times. And we don't act like we should. So the person I think of the most when thinking about being in life's pits and handling the best way is Joseph. Turn with me to the book of Genesis 37. What I want to do is paraphrase the story here, read a few verses here and there to get your mind on what happened here in Genesis 37. We'll start at verse 1. Now, I'm going to set the story for you here. Joseph is one of 12 sons and one daughter. Of being one of 13 children, his dad, Jacob, had a wife named Rachel that he really loved. And if you recall the story about how he came to marry Rachel, he had to work 14 years. I don't know. That's, that's a lot, Scott. If you demand that, you might not ever have a son-in-law. You've got to be a little more fair here. So 14 years he worked for Rachel. He has these four children with Leah, and then he's got these two handmaids, and they keep having children. And finally, Rachel has Joseph. And he's sort of a favorite. We're going to notice that, and the rest of the brothers notice that too. Let's start in Genesis 37, verse 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was estranged in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Elah, with the sons of Zippah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph, talking about Jacob there with, with the name Israel, more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. You've heard the story from your youth of the coat of many colors that our kids learn. We, we do this in a vacation Bible school kids class that I did this coat of many colors. So that's what we get to here. He was the favorite son. And sometimes when we show favorites, what happens? Well, rivalry ensues, jealousy, verse 4. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably into him. Nothing he did to deserve this, but it is what it is. But he goes on, and he has a dream about his future. And in his future, he would hold status over his brothers. Pick up here, verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him yet the more. They already hate him, so now it just adds on to it. Verse 6, and he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep rose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheep stood around about, and made obstinates to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now, we're going to move on down a little bit to verse 14. His brothers are out working. Notice what happens. And he said to him, his father says to Joseph, Go, I pray you, and see whether it be well with your brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron and came to Shechem. So his dad sends him out to check on his older brothers and see how their work's going and how things are going. Skip down to verse 17. He finds him in a city called Dothan. 
And the man said, There departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dover. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dover. Now we're going to read verses 18 through 24. So you're seeing this imagery. Joseph is walking out there, the brothers visually seen coming. They already hate him for his dreams, for his coat of many colors, for being the favorite of their father. Start at verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer comes. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pits. That's sort of the idea of our lesson about life's pits. Let's throw him into some pits. Continuing on there, verse 20, And we will say some evil beast has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Reuben is the oldest brother. And he's got a little bit enough wisdom here to say, No, don't kill him. Just throw him in this pit. Verse 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was come out to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors. That was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Now let's just stop there for a minute. He's come out to check on his brothers for his father's command, his father's wishes. They see him afar off, and you can just hear them saying it. Let's kill him, let's slay him. They're angry, they're mad, it's the mob here. And the oldest brother steps in and says, no, we can't do that. He comes up with the idea of throwing him in this pit that he can't get out of, he'll be stuck. I'll come back later, maybe help him out. They get him in the pit. That's where we're at right now. Well, I'm going to skip on down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to verse 20 for just a minute. We're in Genesis 37. We're going to back up to verse 20. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him. And we will see what become of his dreams. God had given him these dreams these promises, this plan for a reason. You know, sometimes things happen in our life and we don't understand it at all. We don't know why we came across this person. We don't know why we went to the doctor and found out that we've got a terminal illness. We don't understand why we lost a child in our family that was an innocent young child that we loved and cared for so early in life to say, why is this happening, Lord? We don't understand why we didn't get that job that we applied for, that we interviewed for, that we worked for our whole lives. And it's like, this was the job. Why didn't I get it? We don't understand why our relationship with a, a, a young man or young woman that we've been dating and we, we had plans to marry and it's not working out. And we said, why is this not happening for me? Sometimes we just don't make sense of those things during the moment. Our mind is filled and we're intoxicated in, in our thoughts to the point that we just don't see straight. We can't read that thought well. But Joseph, what I want to continue to push here that you're going to see, keeps God first this whole time. Let me tell you what happens for the lot of people. What happens is they get into a pit of life. They find out something bad is going on in their life, bad things are happening, whether it's self-induced or it's, it's just happening and they don't deserve it. They abandon God. They quit going to church. They quit going to worship church. They quit studying. They start making small decisions that are sinful or not as godly uh, first in their life that turn into larger decisions. And I tell you the worst thing that happens is we start isolating ourselves from those that care about us and truly love us. We turn to counsel from worldly people. We turn to counsel from those that tell us what we want to hear rather than what we need to hear. And so in those bits of life, God may have had a plan to say, look, you wanted to marry this man, you wanted to marry this woman, and five years down the road, you meet the love of your life. It's like, well, this really worked out. This is much better for you. You didn't see that then. How many 15-year-old boys and girls had their prayers, and then they break up and say, oh, man, the world's ended. Well, you may get a job in a community or an area where, hey, there's a lot of faithful Christians, and you're going to be able to worship with them, but that job you wanted was so far off, and it was going to pull you out of the church or, or cause you to not be able to put God first. But you couldn't see it at that time. And a lot of times we don't let it play in. God, the way that God will have it by putting him first and trusting his words. Skip to Genesis chapter 50 for a minute. The last chapter here in Genesis. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. I want to point something out. 
I want to set up this scenario for you before I point it out. Here we are a good while later after the famine has happened. And we're going to bring back some of this story, but I, I just want to show you what happened. Just in case you don't know the rest of the story or you forgot, Joseph is sold into slavery. He's made a servant in the gray house here. And as he's doing this, he builds his way up. And he has so much. And eventually everybody's hungry and they're coming for food. They're coming for grain. And his brothers are brought to him. And they don't recognize him. They think he's dead. But he recognizes them. And let me tell you what I would have probably done with my selfish and not as faithful ways of coming. I would probably see my brothers, realize they didn't know me, and I would probably say, it's payback. I would have probably been upset and said, I want to show you, look look what, this dream I had has come true. You know, I would have just had some selfish intention or thought probably looking at him. I don't know that I could have been as good as Joseph. But look what he says to him in chapter 50, verse 4. But as for you, you thought evil against me. When they threw you in that pit, when you tried to kill me, you thought you were doing bad things to me because you were jealous and envious of my dreams and my father's love for me. But listen to what he says. But God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is in this day to save many people alive. God let me get thrown in this pit years ago so that I could be here today to save your lives and many others with this grain and our fortitude to plan ahead through the dreams that God had given him about the fat cows and the thin cows and all the things he had done. God had a plan. The first time we have something bad happen to us sometimes, instead of God having a plan, God doesn't care about it. God doesn't love it. Where is God when I need him? Why aren't things going my way? Why is this happening to me? I've tried to put God first. I've tried to, and sometimes we just go out. So everything that we've studied and prepared for during that tough moment, during that field of life, we just go out. It's not every time. But there's times it happens. We need to make sure that we trust in God's ways during the pits of life. And say, God has a plan. I'm going to continue to put God first and let this play out. Because there may be something bigger and better, more fulfilling down the road than what I thought. God's ways are much better than man's. I'm just a human. I'm just a servant on the earth. When Jesus went to the cross, he was 33 years old. I just turned 34. Just a few months ago. And I told Lonnie when I turned 33, I, all I could think about was this is the year Jesus died. This is the year. And when Jesus died, listen to what I'm about to say because I've thought about this a lot. When Jesus died, he didn't go to the cross and say, you know what? I'm only 33. I've got a lot of life left. This is not fair. When Jesus died, he did not get to the cross and say, I've only been able to go to two countries. I haven't been on very many vacations. I never got to marry. He, he doesn't start generating a list of things he never got to do. What does he do? He dies. You know why? Because it was God's will and God's plan. He understood heaven is much better than all this earth. I don't want to be kept here for another 33 years. If it's time to go, where we go? Because he had been there. He understood how much better heaven is. But you know what people do today? They make a home here. This world becomes their home. They get attached to everything here. And when they think about possibly leaving this earth or losing something they hold a value on this earth, we don't want to abandon it. We don't want to give it up. And this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. But during those pits of life, sometimes that's how we are. And Joseph never acted that way. In Genesis chapter 39, I don't want to take the time to read all this, but I want to remind you of this story. Turn to Genesis 39 for just a moment. <coughs> Genesis chapter 39. He's in the house of Potiphar. That's all we've already mentioned. And Potiphar's giving him everything. And Potiphar's wife was attracted to Joseph, apparently. Now, start there in verse 4. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, he put in his hand. And it came to pass, from the time that he made him overseer of his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house of the field. Skip down to verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, 
lie with me. And in verse 8, but he refused and said, my master gives, uh, would not, has given me everything that's in his house. He's committed to me all that he has to his hand. There is none greater in the house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, I just want to stop right there, and I want to think like a normal human. And I hope this is an honest assessment. Potiphar has to be probably the wealthiest person around at that moment. So I'm going to imagine, just really imagine, that he probably had a beautiful wife. I'm going to say that she was probably a fairly attractive lady. And I'm going to say that Joseph, like most of us, would be attracted to an attractive lady or for the ladies of man. And that would be a difficult position for a lot of us. To deny the lust of the flesh, to commit a sin such as this, because this is another man's wife. So that's a tough position for him. And again, I gotta imagine she was probably not somebody that would just be, you know, it's a little different. Either. But he continues to deny this. And what does he get in return for it? Some great blessing, some great reward. He gets thrown in jail for it. Because she lies and says that it's his idea. And then he kept coming on to her. And so now he's in prison for doing the right thing. Now listen to that. He's been thrown into slavery by his brothers, essentially. Sold into slavery, thrown in the pit, then sold into slavery. Now he's in jail for doing the right thing again. Well, what's he done wrong? But you know, I meet people all the time. And they will tell you nobody in the world. Listen to what I'm going to say. Nobody can understand the problems they're doing. You've never been in my position, so don't talk to me about it. Don't try to preach to me about it. You don't know what it's like to lose a loved one. You're, you, I'm the first one who's ever lost a loved one. Nobody can say that. You don't know what it's like to have somebody in your family to do. You don't know what it's like to lose this position. You just will never understand what I've been through. And I will say this. I can't say that every position I, I can truly understand because I've been in their shoes. I haven't been. But I guarantee you, y'all have been through things, some of you, that we will never understand. And that can be said for many people. But I can tell you this, God created us all. He has a plan for all of us. And if we would trust his ways, instead of taking things into our own hands, we, like Joseph, could let his will play out. Well, what happens next? He's in the jail. He interprets the baker's dream. He interprets the butler's dream. These dreams play a huge role. Then he interprets Potiphar's dream. Which again is the famine's coming. He does so much. And when his brothers returned, his words were, You were trying to do evil to me because you were envious, but God had a plan. The next time something bad happens in your life, or you think that things aren't going your way, can we look in the mirror and say, God's got a plan? Now, if we're doing committing sin and it's several things, that's not to say, Well, God's got a plan. That's not what I'm saying. But when things happen that are out of control, we've got to trust the Lord. So, what are some of the life's bids for us? Well, tragic events and troubling circumstances. I feel sorry for anybody here who's lost someone before they felt like they should. But I'll be honest with you. I lost my grandpa a few years ago when he was 88 years old. And if I'd had it my way, I'd have never lost him. Virgil, we'd have kept Nelson around all as long as we could have, right? Because I loved him. Because I cared for him. And it would hurt to lose anybody you cared for. I don't care when it is. What about medical issues? There's got to be somebody in this building, if not half the them, that have had serious medical conditions already in your life. Some people have it. These St. Jude's Children's Hospital, you've got kids that are three years old and little kids. What did they do to deserve that? It's, it's tough. I'm not standing up here pretending like, well, this is okay, this is great. It's not. It's tough. And, and sometimes it makes me think just how much more blessed I've been to think about the, the small elements that I've had to put up with. But yet, sometimes when we put up with those things, we act like the world's in it. And if we blame people, we isolate ourselves and we forget God. What about we start to focus on ourselves instead of God during these moments? And then what overtakes us is self pity despair, depression. And again, I know that some of these things people battle with. But what if when we were battling with these things, we turned to God and His Word and trust in Him and said, I want to see what the Lord's got in store for me. I want to continue to put Him first because He's the only one that can pull me out of this. 
And sometimes it's just the consequences of our poor decisions. One of the nicest men that ever met, I met him working at a golf course right out of high school, and he was in jail. And he came every day to work on the work release. And when I talked to him, I didn't know this for the longest time, and I found out, you know, he's on work release, and he's one of the nicest guys. Like, what is this guy in jail for that, he, that he's going to be there the rest of his life? Well, when he was 20 years old, he got drunk. And he was driving a car with three other people, and they had an accident, and one of them died. And he got a DUI and manslaughter charge against him, and he's in prison for it. I don't think he woke up that morning planning on killing him. But he made a poor decision. He made a dumb decision. There's no reason to drink alcohol. Scripture gives us no reason <coughs> to avoid all evil. And we see all the evil associated with alcohol. He drunk alcohol. He made a mistake. He caught a bad break. Had an accident, she died. And now he's suffering for that consequence. And we may do things in our life where we're suffering to this day because of a poor choice. Now, here's the thing. You can't change the past. There's no reason every day to dwell on it and think, you know what, I really messed up. Really. But you can move forward and say, I'm going to do better now and not let that stop me from being the best I can be moving forward. We've all seen and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And as Paul said, he put those things behind him. Paul made a lot of mistakes. He persecuted a lot of Christians. But he didn't let it stop him from being the great preacher that he was down the road. And there's a lot of people here that say, I've made a lot of mistakes. I'll never deserve to be blocked by I'll never deserve to be working for the Lord. We've got to let those things go and move forward and repent. But even when you do that, your sins will be forgiven, washed away. You can go to heaven and, and God will forget it. On this earth, you're still going to pay for some of those sins. Someone that's done drugs for 30 years, they may repent, turn to the Lord and be the most faithful Christian. But their body is still going to suffer effects from doing the drugs. You see, there are consequences to our sins that stick with us, even though our sins can be forgiven. That's why everybody has hope of eternal life. What are some hazards we face while in the pit? Well, the first one I want to say is bitterness. You ever met somebody or know somebody that's had some tough times life, and now they're just so bitter? You can hardly talk to them because they're just mad at the world. They're bitter. They're angry all the time. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 42. Look at verse 21. Genesis 42 verse 21. And they said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besaw us. And we were not here. Therefore is this distress come upon us. They were bitter at Joseph. That's what got him in that position in the first place. Bitterness. Tell me what good bitterness does. Tell me some pros for bitterness. That's a good answer. There's not really any. I can't think of it. Look at Psalm 105. Psalm 105, verses 17 through 19. He sent a man before them, even Joseph. Who are we referencing here in Psalm? Well, Joseph. Even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. You know, a lot of times we have a chance to let our light shine, prove ourselves like Joseph did, to be tried. But we stop and we don't allow it to happen because we're good. Here's a chance to talk to a fallen away brother. But they did something that made me mad, that made me angry. So I'm bitter and I won't talk to them. I won't forgive them. I won't treat them with the respect that they're due. We can't become bitter when we have hazards and we're in pits of life. And I'll tell you something. As we age, something I noticed amongst people that are much older than I am, it's easy to become bitter about the world we live in. Well, that ain't the United States I grew up in. I was kidding. I believe that. But you know, we get bitter. We become bitter. What about despair? Look at Psalm chapter 34, please. Psalm 34. Look at verses 17 through 20. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart, and saves such as can be contrite spirit, of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Listen to that. God delivers us. He hears us when we're having despair, when we're having problems, and we're upset. Verse 20, he keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. The Lord knows when we're having tough times. He cares. 
He understands. We sing that song. Does Jesus care? Yes, he cares. I know he cares. In 1 Peter chapter 5 at verse 7, notice what Peter says. 1 Peter 5 at verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. One of the hazards is we don't cast our care upon him because we're despaired, we're depressed. And instead of turning to God, we turn away from God. How many countless people have come through this field that finally hit those pits of life and they've got into a discouraging, despair, depressed attitude of life. And instead of being more at Bible class and more into worship services, they started missing more and more and more. The church isn't doing anything for me. I'm not, it's not helping me through my problems. What an attitude. That's not an attitude of faith or trust in God. And that's one of the hazards when we get into peace. Is we think the opposite of the way we probably should. What about resent? His brothers resented him. In Mark 11 at verse 25. Mark chapter 11 at verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have all against any. That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Well, look at verse 26. But if you don't forgive, then will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. You know, there's some people that are resentful towards other people. Maybe a co-worker, a friend, a family member. And even in the church, people get angry at each other and they're resentful. Well, I don't want to see Larson. I'm mad at Larson. I can't stand Larson. <coughs> That's a hazard. And if I have that attitude, I can't do the will of the Lord. I can't work out his problems. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. That's what Paul says to Ephesians in Ephesians 4, at verse 31. Let all bitterness, we've already talked about that, right? Wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It's that malice. Wanting to harm someone or do evil to resent. And a lot of times when we're going through those pits of life, sometimes that becomes our right. attitude. We'll resent those that are not going through pits. We're envy, we're jealous, we're bitter. We've got to put that away. That's not a cross like attitude. And I tell you one that you just can't help is someone that gives up. Someone that gives up. Lonnie needs to do a lesson here for y'all on goats. Not the ones in Matthew 25, but literal goats. They're the worst thing in the world to give up. Lucas, could you share some? Goats will just go out to a point, and as they say, they look for a place to die by. Huh? That's not a joke. But people think goats will eat anything that's right. That ain't true. They'll give up in a heartbeat. And a lot of times, Christians, they go through one tough time in life. One battle. I'm done. God didn't come through and save you and rescue me like I thought God was supposed to do. I know. In Hebrews chapter 3, let's look at verses 12 and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Joseph never departed. He stuck it through. Job never departed. He stuck it through. And many others. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily. We need that encouragement daily. Hey, be here on Sunday. Be here on Wednesday. Why? So that we can keep encouraging each other because it may be something that happens Monday or Tuesday that's pulling you down into a pit. You come here Wednesday and be edified and built up and encouraged by your brethren to get back out. Continue that verse. While it is called today, lest any of you be pardoned through the deceitfulness of sin. Lest sin cause us to give up quit. And the less you're away from Christians and spiritual uh, works and studies, more likely it is to fall into a pit or to be drugged down by the world around us. The only way out of a hole is to climb up. You know? You can stay in that pit and you'll just die. Or you can climb up. So to conclude the lesson, I just want to say, if you ever fall into a pit of life, don't just lay there. Don't give up. Don't drown in depression and despair and resentment. And think you're the only person it's ever happened to? Don't forget God or turn away from God or blame God. Get out of the hole. 
Fix it. Work on it. Expect persecution and difficulty. I'm sorry, the font would go there, but that's 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live God, listen, all that are going to try to be Christians in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He doesn't say some of them. He says all. There's going to be times that if you're trying to do the right thing, you're going to suffer persecution for it. Expect it. Expect it. Let your conduct, just like Joseph's, he could have gotten to that jail and said, Lord, I've been in a pit. I've been so slow, I've done everything right, and now I'm back in jail. Why me? Why does this keep happening? You never see that. Let your conduct be worthy of the good news of the gospel. Come what may. Let people look at you and say, they've had the worst look, terrible things happen, and they still put God first. They're still trying to live this Christian life. Something is, is just there. Jesus did that. Not many things went his way, but he went sinless even though. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians 1, look at verses 27 through 30. Only let your conversation be as it comes to the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you of salvation and that of God. For to you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. See, the faith is not just believing. A lot of people teach that. Faith is what he said it's not just believe, but to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict that you saw in me and out here to the end. And when we do go through events and trials and temptations, handle it grace. Count it all joy, as James would say. Trust that God, through whatever happens in your life, is working it all out for the best. He's got a plan. Right, folks? You're a teacher, then you're not a teacher, then he's getting a teaching coach for boys. What a blessing. What a great opportunity for him and his family, and the kids at that congregation, or at that school, to have a godly man in that school. A couple of them, right? Miss Taylor? Several good Christian ladies. What a, man. what a blessing. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, one of my favorite verses, if you're looking for encouragement tonight, and you're a Christian, what a verse to think about. If you're not a Christian, you want to be in on this verse. In Romans 8, verse 28, he says, We all know that all, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call of the Lord of this Isaac. Excuse me. Abraham loved God, worked out for good when he was going to offer a son. Noah loved God, he and his family were spared. Right? Moses loved God, Joseph loved God, Job loved God. It all worked out for good, but every day was good. Not for any. We need to wait patiently. Don't we ever give up your faith? In Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2. I waited patiently for the Lord. Not many people will do that anymore. We can do a whole lesson right there. I waited patiently for the Lord. No, I didn't wait patiently. I looked for a Christian spouse for years. I couldn't find one. So I just married the first person that showed me interest. And now I have no interest in God because my husband and wife has pulled me away from the Lord. I didn't wait patiently for God. The first job that came along that threw big money at me, I took it. Never thought anything about how it would affect myself. I didn't wait patiently for God. I had a chance to do something I always wanted to do. And I thought, well, I was going to do it now. Just abandon heaven. So I chose to live my life here in this earth and lose my heart. Not many people will wait patiently for the Lord. But here he says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up also. Listen to this verse to end the lesson. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the merry clay, and set my feet on a rock and established my feet. What a way to end. We start with Joseph being thrown into a pit. We end with the psalmist writer saying, I waited patiently, and he pulled me out of the pit. If you're here tonight, and you want to be a pit of life, and you go through it, if you'll wait and trust in the Lord, on that judgment day, he'll pull you up out of the pit. He'll put you in heaven eternally, and whatever pit you ever went through, it'd be worth it all. But if you get in these pits and you abandon God and you forget God and you don't trust God, you think you've been in a pit now? 
You think you've seen fits of life on this earth? There's no fit on this earth that will compare to him. There's no bad day on this earth that will compare to a bad day in heaven. Because hell is eternal. Eternal condemnation, eternal destruction, eternal punishment. It's an evil place. So whatever pit you suffer here, count it worthy to be suffered from the reward of heaven. And staying out of that pit of hell that we know that we will go to. In conclusion, God has a purpose. To teach you patience. Well, that's tough for me at times. To rid us of our pride. That may be even tough. To help us learn to trust his providence. Trust my ways. Let me use you, Joseph, to save all these people years later. You're not going to like the path, but please, uh, and Joseph does. And look at what good came from it. To prepare us for future service. I shot a lot of basketball in my yard growing up. Started on dirt. Then we finally got concrete. Well, that was a blessing. But I was sitting there shooting free throws over and over. And you know what I imagine. You've done it before. You've done it a lot more than I have in real life. But I always imagine one day I might get a shot to take that shot the game with the game on the line. Just like any kid would imagine. And you know what I learned from being a player and a coach basketball? Was a lot of kids do that at home, but in a real game, not every kid wants that opportunity. As a coach, you go to your bench and you look at them, and it's a tie game. And they're about to shoot a free throw to win the game, a technical shot. If you said, who wants to shoot this shot? There's going to be a few kids that raise their hand and say, oh, me, me, me. I've been waiting for this my whole life. I practice. And there's a few kids that practiced it their whole life. But in that moment, they're so nervous and they're so scared, they don't really want to take that shot. Please don't put me out there, coach. I'm nervous. I'm not ready. That's us. We come to church. We study. We pray. We worship. And then in real life, we get our chance to be Joe's. We get our chance to be Joe. We get our chance to be Isaac. Or David, I'll keep saying Isaac. And a lot of times we don't really want that shot. Lord, please don't put me in that spot because if you do, I'm liable to really mess this up. I'm probably going to give in temptation. I'm probably going to be bitter and resentful. I'm probably not going to let this work out the way you want it to. Please give them this shot. Let's prepare and practice for that moment in training so that when we have pits of life, God can shine through us. Others can see it and good things can happen. And just like Joseph, we can bring glory to him and work out his plan, just like Jesus did. Jesus could have abandoned the plan at any time. And then what would we be? Where are your kids and your grandkids? Your neighbors and your friends can be if you abandon the plan. There's people counting on you. And the Lord. We need to make sure we're prepared for that future service. We've already read from Romans. But I just want to ask, are you one of life's kids? Maybe you're going through a tough time. Maybe you've forgotten God or not trusted Him too much during these tough times of your life. Well, maybe you've been through it before and you came out on top and you can share your advice and your score with others, just like we see Joseph. Why don't you lean on the Lord? Lean on the Lord to help you during the pits of life, trusting His providence and His plan. Give Him a shot. Put Him first in every way, like we see Joseph do. I'm going to read from Romans 8 in the last few years and we'll see our song invitation. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 18 through 24. The lesson is yours. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. Please listen to this passage. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Whatever I got to go through on earth, it ain't going to compare to what I'm going to get in heaven. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who was subjected to the same hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan with our, within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Whatever you have to give up or sacrifice or deal with on sir, it doesn't compare to Tonight, if you're not a Christian, hell is a pit that you won't be able to get out of. But God gave his son so that you could avoid that pit. 
And tonight, if you want the, the way to get out of that pit, you've got to turn. Confess his name. Confess your belief in him. Repent, turn from your sins. Be baptized, have your sins washed away. And then serve him faithfully to your death. Maybe you've done that, but you've gotten into some pits of sin. And you need to get out of them and get back on the straight your path. Well, you know what? If you're out in the woods by yourself and you fall in a 20-foot hole, you're in trouble. Tonight, you've got a lot of people around. And we want to help pull you out. There's times I've been in pits and I need somebody to pull me out. I know you can do the same. So if we can help you tonight to be added to the Lord's church, to avoid that pit of hell, or to get out of a pit in your life right now, why don't you come and we sing this song that's been so long. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.